Last week, we created a problem for ourselves that this week we need to solve. And I've been talking with many of you this week, and and you're like, can we meet Wednesday maybe and solve the problem? Because Sunday seems like a long ways away for this problem to scratch at my soul. So we're going to get there. But for those maybe of you who weren't here, or for those who were, and I, I, I want us to take five minutes and review last Sunday's message, because that's the springboard, that's the foundation upon which we're going to move into this morning's topic. And so we're in a series, four-week series called Viral Church, and we're essentially walking through the key foundational, fundamental, theological, doctrinal convictions that are at the burning center of everything that's driving Grace City Church. And so we've been looking at these truths together last week, this week, and next two weeks. I gave four reasons last week why I wanted to do these messages. The first was theological, and I said from A.W. Tozer that the most important thing about us is what comes into our minds when we think of God. What The most important thing about us as a church is what comes into our minds when we think of God. That will shape everything you say, do, think. It'll shape how you pray. It'll shape everything. In fact, in our DNA time this, this week, one of the guys in our DNA said, Sunday morning's message didn't fit the profile of God I have in my mind. Isn't that a great way to put it? Every person on the planet who loves Jesus or hates Jesus has a profile of God in their mind. And whether they know it or not, their life is moving toward that profile and living out of the reality of that profile. And so he's like, the problem with Sunday was that it didn't fit in the profile I had of God. So the question becomes... Is our profile of God biblical? If you read the Bible, you'll, you'll know that most people in the Bible who met God didn't have a profile about Him because they were too busy trying to bury their face in the dirt in His presence. We profile things we, 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 we want to understand. God is beyond our ability to understand He won't fit profiles. He is who he is. So we need to get it right. Reason number two, theological, number one. Second reason is biographical. It was eight years ago for myself and a few others that these truths went off like an atomic bomb in our hearts that provide the passion and motivation and drive that ended up becoming Grace City Church. And I, I want you to have that atomic bomb, that nuclear you know, radiating truth in your gut, in your soul, so that you could have similar passion. And I want you to know it because I want my joy to be completed in sharing it. You'll understand that later. Reason number three was was missional. So theological, biographical, missional. I believe that God's Word teaches we've been made to be a missionary people. It's who we are in Christ. It's why we're here. And I want us to be good missionaries. I want us to be effective missionaries. I want us to be missionaries that do their job well, that are joy-filled in doing it, that orient everything around us. All they can think about is being good, effective, wise missionaries to wherever God has sent them. And so the most important thing for a missionary to know what must be at the center burning at the heart of a missionary is that mission is not ultimate. Mission is not ultimate. There's something bigger and above mission that is informing it and driving it, and it's not mission itself. It's something bigger. And so to strike the note that will ring over 2014 that I believe will be the most fruitful year we've seen as a church, and with that will be the most difficult year we've had as a church, because advancement always meets resistance. So resistance is never like, oh no, we're doing something wrong. Resistance is like, okay, we must still be on the right track. But if we're going to hold and we're going to stand and we're going to stay and we're going to last, we need to have this truth and these truths at the bottom of what we do and who 
we are. Fourth reason was pastoral. Many of you are new to GCC. Many of you are new to the faith. Many of you are new to Jesus. And I want very much for these truths to get set in your heart. I want all of us to understand the engine that's driving the train of GCC four. Last week I said we, you know, some of us have come because we like the tire. Some of us come because we like the paint color. None of those things matter ultimately in the end. What all of us need to love is the engine. So we're popping the hood. We're looking underneath. We're saying, what is driving this movement, this body of believers, this church? And I'm saying what I said last week, what I'm going to say this week, is what's driving GCC. And I want you to know that. Because if you're here because you like the music, or you're here because you like the pack, or you're here because you like something else other than the engine, you won't be here very long. And so I don't want you to waste your time and be disappointed in eight months and go up to leave. You can, you, know, you can leave now and go somewhere else if you'd like. And I'm not saying you need to leave. I'm just saying... I don't want to bait and switch smoke and mirrors you down the road and you'd be disappointed. I want you to know from the beginning who we are, what we're about, why we're about what we're about, and where we're going. So I want you to love it. I want you to own it, articulate it. I want you to experience it. I want you to feel it. It will keep you as a Christian and it will keep you as a missionary. And I'm hoping that as we move through the year and things get hard and difficult and tough, that you, myself, we'll come back to these messages. We'll listen to them and go, okay, yeah, right. <laughs> What was the root again? Right. And that will keep us saved. It will keep us sent. It will keep us kept. So last week, the truth that we unpacked last week was the, the very biblical but sometimes controversial truth that God is the most God-centered being in all of the universe. God does everything he does for the glory of himself. God's not an idolater. He does not worship any other God but himself. He does not break the first commandment he's called us to obey. He loves himself with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his mind, all of his strength. God is passionate about himself. And that's a problem because when you tell Christians that your duty is to live for the glory of God, they go, totally get it. When you tell them, oh, by the way, that's God's passion too, they're like, what? That doesn't make as much sense. But the overwhelming testimony of Scripture that we read last week is that this is so. Isaiah 48, 11. For my own sake, for my own name's sake, I do all of these things. How can I let myself be defamed? Answer, I cannot. I will not give my glory to another. So what we saw is that God not only acts decisively through history in such a way as to be worthy of praise, He's acting decisively through all of human history precisely to win praise. Those are two different things. He is worthy of praise, to be sure, but he is not passive in the winning of praise for himself. He is actively, jealously pursuing and sovereignly governing all things so that he will get praise for himself. And that's the turn, or that's the, the, the difference in our thinking that we've got to get. Because we're okay, most of us, thinking about a God who, who, who is so cool he'd be worthy of my praise if I feel like giving it. But I find it rubs us differently when we say, not only is he worthy of praise, but he acts decisively to win it for himself. It's important to say it that way, I think, because it's an antidote for our subtle man-centeredness. And this is why we said it's so important to understand this, because if we are God-centered as a people, because we believe that God is man-centered, we are man-centered. We've got to get that. If we love being God-centered because we fundamentally believe that God is fundamentally and ultimately man-centered, we are man-centered. In other words, we're, we're using God to do for us what we did before we found God, namely ex- exalt ourselves. And so... We should question our our God-centeredness if we're not happy with the biblical truth that God is God-centered too. 
That was last week. And that creates a problem. Here's the rub that it gets created when we say God loves himself more than he loves you, and therein lies the foundation for which he can love you when worthy as you are. The reason that creates a problem is, in the words of someone I talked with this week, that doesn't make me feel very important. That doesn't make me feel loved. I'm not sure I want to worship a God who's God-centered. It makes me feel like I, like I don't matter. Aha. Now we're moving into the center. So the question that we ended last week with was, how can the blatant and patently God-centered motives of God in all that he does be loving? How can the self-exaltation of God be loving? Because at first blush, it makes me feel not very loved. It makes me feel not very important. It makes me feel not much of a big deal. That's the personal rub. But for some of you who read your Bible, there could be a scriptural rub. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What about 1 Corinthians 13, 5? Love seeks not its own. Ha, ha, I got you. Well, that's a problem. What about Matthew 23? Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Ha! What about Mark 10? For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. See? See? He came for me. He didn't come to be served, but to serve me. See? I, love doesn't exalt itself. So how could... We make this fit with the 10 scriptures we read last week and the 40 I could have read that said God does everything for himself. How does that work? God is a God of love. He must be for us, right? So, so which is it then? Is God for us or for himself? So my main idea this morning is to show you that God's aim to be glorified and God's acting so as to glorify himself is the most loving thing he could do. God glorifying himself and God loving you are not two distinct acts. They are one and the same thing. The only rub comes... When we separate them out and think, God glorifying himself above me can't be loving because, this is what is actually underneath that good thought, I'm not being glorified. You wouldn't say it like that to me, but that's what's underneath your question. God's glorification of himself is not unloving. It's actually precisely how he loves us. But there are many people who do not believe this. Let me read a few quotes to you from some prominent atheists you might recognize and a few celebrities. Just throw those in as well, right? Oprah. We know what I think about Oprah. I won't pull out the big stick here. Oprah walked away from Orthodox Christianity when she was about 27. Because of the biblical teaching of God being a jealous God. She sat in a church service. She tells a story. She sat in a church service and she heard the, the, the preacher, like me, say, God is jealous for his glory, which is simply quoting passages out of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah. I mean, it's not like making it up.
She heard that God demands that he be above everyone else in our allegiances and affections, and she said, that doesn't sound like a loving God to me. So she walked away from Orthodox Christianity into whatever sorts of spiritualistic religion she's kind of creating for herself along the way as a spiritual sojourner, so she calls. Brad Pitt, the great theologian, I say it jokingly, but we're all theologians, right? Really, all of us think something about God. Brad Pitt turned away from his boyhood faith that he was raised with because he's, he heard God saying, you have to say that I'm best. And he said, that seems as if God's just all about his ego, not interested. He walked. Richard Dawkins, the famous Atheist, author in our our generation, one of the more famous, wrote this. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most, he's got big words in here, so hang with me, arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloody, ethnic cleanser, a uh, a misogynist, misogynistic, 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 thank you. Told you some big words in here. That's the first one of like 10, so hang on. Misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, infanticidal, filicidal, megalomaniacal, ega, egomaniacal, egomaniacal. He's using all these $10 words to make himself feel smart. Sadomasochistic. <laughs> capricious I don't know what that next word is I'm not going to try to say it bully is how he ends it it is a freeing thing he ends the quote to liberate oneself from such primitive superstition such as the existence of God one last atheist said that he read scripture verses like Psalm 2410, who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. He read that verse. And then he read Psalm 29, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Now listen to these. And then he read Psalm 62, sing The glory of his name, give to him his glorious praise. And he knew that the teaching of Scripture is that God himself inspired all of Scripture. And so he read the psalmist exhorting people to praise God, praise God, praise God. He connected the dots that that was God inspiring man to command men through Scripture to praise himself, praise himself, praise himself. God's saying, praise me, praise me, praise me, through the psalmist's exhortation to you to praise God, praise God, praise God. And he said it sounded like an old woman demanding compliments. That's C.S. Lewis who said that before God saved him. So here's why we stumble at the God-centeredness of God in relationship to how we feel when we heard it, hear it put that way, we stumble because we do not know what love is. We have a fallen world, sin-stained, self-centered definition of what love is and therefore what it means to be loved, and we project that on God, and when it's different, we go, no, that's not right. Self-esteem in America has become the highest virtue. It is the ground. If you listen, if you have ears to hear, self-esteem is the ground for all parenting philosophies, all educational systems, all entertainment, all morality, all marketing and advertising, and that has seeped into the ground of the definition of the gospel. 
God loved you so much that he couldn't stand spending another moment without you. And so he did whatever it takes to himself to get to you because he loves you so much. End of gospel definition. And I want to say to that, wrong. We've got to get this. God could go without you for the rest of eternity and be absolutely and completely happy and content. There is no deficiency in God that you can complete. There is no deficiency in God's self-esteem that needs you to fill it with your stamp of approval in accepting him into your life. There just isn't. He's complete. He's absolutely happy. He's absolutely there with or without you. We got to get that. If we don't, we will misconstrue everything about who God is, why he does what he does. And when I say that, people meet me in the lobby and they go, how could you say God is not a God of love? Which I say, that's not what I said. I'm not saying God is not a God of love. God is absolutely, absolutely, radically a God of love more than you have the capacity to comprehend this morning. What I'm saying is, he loves you in a way that you would not define on your own apart from the freeing word of God. So here's a question I want to put forward for you. And this is the same question. If you read my blog post yesterday, this is the same question verbatim, word for word, that John Piper asked 17,000 college students eight years ago, of which I was one sitting in the upper deck with Adam, that blew my world to smithereens. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it for you verbatim. I don't think it could be worded any better. And this is, this is a, the litmus test for how you define love as a person. You, you listen, and then you, you think how you would answer the question in your mind, and we'll walk into it. The question is, is this. Do you feel more loved by God when He makes much of you? Or when, at great cost to Himself, he enables you to make much of him. They're not the same thing. One definition, you are at the center. The other definition, God is at the center. So I'll ask it again. Do you feel more loved when you think about God making much of you? Or when you think about God at great cost to himself, enabling you to make much of him. And how you answer that question will be how you define love. So here's an alternative definition to love that we, we can work with. Love is not making much of someone. Th th this will radically change your parenting. In fact, in our gospel community last week, we were wrestling with this, and we were, they were all... We talked for a couple, a couple hours in my living room, like, how can God, this is amazing, it's self-authenticating, it's biblical, it's freeing, it's invigorating, it's soul-stirring. I love it, but I, I'm not able to connect it to how God would love me. And I, and I said, well, come back next week because you intuitively know that to love your children, how you want God to love you is bad for them. At least you should. And some parents who love their children, how they want God to love them, ruins their children. So good parents get this. Love is not making much of someone, new definition of love. Love is laboring, working, striving, straining, suffering if necessary to enthrall another person with that which will make them eternally and infinitely happy. Love is laboring and suffering, if necessary, to enthrall other people with that which will make them eternally happy, namely Christ. Do you get that? That's our working definition for love this morning. So if that's what love is, and it is, 
then God's constant exalting of his glory for our enjoyment is the most loving thing he could do. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love seeks not its own, he's describing a love between humans. In loving other humans, don't exalt yourself. In loving other humans, don't exalt them. They don't need that. They don't need to be raptured with you. They don't need to be enraptured with them. That's the clinical definition of sickness, to be stuck on exalting yourself. They need to be freed from worshiping you or freed from worshiping themselves and lost in the self-forgetfulness of worshiping something better, greater, more glorious than them. That would be how to love them because heaven will not be a hall of mirrors where you like what you see. It won't be. Heaven will be the one place, finally, where you will be forever and eternally freed from being stuck on and consumed with and conscious of yourself, and you'll be freed of that because you'll be consumed by worshiping, praising, glorifying something bigger and better than you, and that will be amazing for you. Heaven's not going to be like, oh man, there's that big glorious thing, but I'm pretty cool too. No! Heaven will be an eternal exercise of getting joy from worshiping the one all-glorious being in the universe, and you won't even know you've forgotten yourself. That's heaven. Heaven will not be a hall of mirrors where you're continually trying to talk yourself into liking what you see. Heaven will be where you will finally and eternally be freed from thinking of yourself because you're consumed in the worship of another. Perhaps a word from C.S. Lewis here would be helpful to help us see how God exalting himself in order to be praised is love. In his book, Reflections on the Psalms, he wrote the following. But the most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything, strangely escaped me. I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or the giving of honor. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. You know this is true. I watched it happen all day yesterday. Right? Green and blue. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses, readers their favorite poet, walkers praising the countryside, players their favorite game. Praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, voices, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians and scholars. My whole more general difficulty about the praise of God depended on my absurdly, absurdly denying to us in regards to the supremely valuable, what we delight to do naturally, what indeed we can't help but doing about everything else we value. I think we delight to be to praise what we enjoy because the praise is huge. The praise not merely expresses, but completes the enjoyment. Worship and praise Think about this about the football game yesterday. Worship and praise doesn't just express joy, it completes joy. Praise is joy's appointed consummation. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until it is expressed. How many people were at the Seattle game yesterday? I have no idea. 
68,000. 68,000 people yesterday confirmed this theological truth that C.S. Lewis is making for us. Not one person there, when Marshawn Lynch scored the touchdown to seal the game, not one person there thought, that was so awesome. That was a great run. <sighs> I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> and I'm really happy about it. But I, I don't want to let anybody know that. I don't want it to go to Marshawn's head. He's obviously down there trying to win a game, which would have been glory to himself. And I, I don't feel love when he wins games like that. <laughs> Anybody do that yesterday? Nobody, and there's profoundness in our laughing because we know that's not how it works. You couldn't help it. He swings around the end, takes it to the house. And 68,000 people, no orchestration, no sign on the billboard, cheer now. It's like, Whoa, yeah, I'm happy. And that doesn't come to consummation fully until I go, yeah, and I praise Marshawn, man. That's worship right there. I'm on the winning team, and he just won for us, and I'm a Seahawk. Bow, wow, wow, bow down, go Hawks. Woo! I mean, that's happening, right? It would not be loving for the Seattle organization to take an ad out in the, in the Seattle Times and say, for the sake of not giving our team a, head, a big head, please do not cheer this week. <laughs> That'd be stupid. I want to cheer because it makes me, I mean, I'm up in the house in Leavenworth with a few people, and I'm going, yeah, yeah, taking it home, woo! <laughs> because I was happier doing that then just staying in my seat and going, oh, that's pretty cool. Therefore, if God is to love us, he cannot be indifferent to whether or not we praise him. The problem is you and I were born broken. You and I were born broken so that we see someone score a touchdown and we don't get it. We don't cheer like we should. Jesus is winning every day, and we yawn and go, how come he doesn't make it about me? Therefore, if God is truly for us, and if he will give us the best and make our joy full, he must make it his aim so as to do whatever it takes to fix what's broken so that we might praise him like we were created to do. And this, is, this is corporate event here. I talked to my close friend Chris Foreman who was there, like, you know, upper deck, nosebleed, back corner seats kind of deal. And he called after. I said, what was it like? He goes, oh, unbelievable. Why? He goes, Standing room only, on our feet, the entire game, high-fiving, everybody within a 10-foot radius I've never met, all going crazy. He was swept up in the worship, and I'm not saying it in a bad way, in the enjoyment and the, the praise of a winning team, and it instantly unified him with every stranger in that stadium. Isn't that crazy? That's heaven. where we will be instantaneously unified with people we've never met in the cheering and the worship and the praise and the roar of adulation that will rise continually for eternity to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can you wait? That's where we're going. It would not loving, be loving for God to say, I, I know this makes some of you uncomfortable, so let's bring Josh up and cheer for him. I don't need that. I don't want that. 
And you don't need it either if you're biblically sane. Because it'd be a lie to worship me because I'm not worthy of it. So put the pieces together. If God were to love you, what must he give you? He must give you what's best for you. The best thing for you in all the universe is God. If he were to give you all health, best job, best spouse, best technology, best vacations, best car, best success in any realm, and withhold from you himself, he would hate you. And if he gives you himself and nothing besides, he loves you infinitely. Therefore, we must have God for our enjoyment if God is to love us. And Lewis has helped us see that that joy will not reach full consummation until it expresses itself in praise. Therefore, God, if he is to love us, cannot be indifferent to whether or not we praise him. That's the biblical definition and thinking when it comes to defining love and how we're loved by God. So let's take the remaining time we have, which is not very much, and put some biblical footing under what I've just said. I have 10 here. We won't get to all of those. I could use have more. It's everywhere once you see this. We'll look at a couple, and then we'll conclude our time together. John 11, verse 1. You can turn there if you want. John 11, verse 1. One asks the question, what did Jesus' love towards those he loved accomplish? What did Jesus' love towards those he said he loved accomplish? John 11, it's the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Verse 2. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So there's an intimate connection here. Jesus, we know, loves Mary and Martha and her brother. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So we have Jesus in the story, and we have the fact that he loves these people in the story. So now we want to ask, what does he do to express his love to those he loves? Verse 4, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So now we have Jesus, love, and glory, all in one passage. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha, don't miss it, Jesus loved Martha and her sisters and Lazarus. So we got Jesus saying, this is going to glorify me and I love you. Same passage. What does he do? Verse 6. Therefore, we're un, so therefore, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was and he let him die. Have you ever read it like that? I love you, Mary. I love you, Mara. I love you, Lazarus. I heard the news. I could come and save him, but I'm not because I love you. This illness isn't to death, but to glorify me. So I'm going to stay where I am. I'm going to let him die. The only way that passage makes sense is if we realize it's worth the death of Lazarus to show the glory of God to Lazarus. And it's worth your death too if that's what it takes. John Piper once said, if you get cancer when you're 18, you'll see God. If you don't get cancer when you're 18, you might see God. What did he mean? He meant that Life and health and happiness is seldom used as a springboard with which to worship and see and savor and love Jesus Christ as it was designed to. 
But when things get taken away like health or job or family, and we have nothing else to love and worship, we're forced to look to the only one left standing, and it's Jesus. And in that moment, he has loved us in taking from us what distracted us from seeing him. And so God's loving Lazarus was removing things from his view that kept him from seeing Jesus, things like health and life. That's why suffering can be such a gift, because it brings into view the Lord Jesus Christ in ways we could never see him apart from it. How about John 3.16? Got this one thrown at me a few times this week. It's my favorite. What about John 3.16, Josh? Let's look at it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, listen to this definition of the word agapao, which is the word love that John uses here. The word agapao, or love, can be known only from the actions that prompt it. God's love is seen in the gift of his son. This this is a Greek commentary. This isn't like anybody with an agenda. It's just like, what's what the word means? Obviously, this is not the love of complacency or affection. That is, it is not drawn out or given because of any excellency in its objects. This love isn't being poured out because the ones that are being loved are amazing. Romans 5, 8, right? Before we were lovely, God died for us while we were still in our sins, right? It was an exercise of a divine will in a deliberate choice made without assignable cause save that which lies in the nature of God himself. In respect to agapao, the word love, used of God, it expresses the deep and constant love and interest of a perfect, perfect being towards entirely unworthy objects, producing and fostering a reverential love in them toward the giver and a practical love towards those who are partakers of the same and a desire to help others seek the giver themselves. Question, what is the goal of God's love for us? Answer, to enable you to enjoy Him. Question, what does God's love accomplish for you? Answer, it restores your ability to see, know, love, serve, worship, glorify Him. Question, What will everlasting life be if that's the end of God's love for us? Answer, everlasting life will be us spending eternity singing the praises of Jesus and enjoying Him in His unabated presence forever. Question, what does God's love through Christ accomplish for us? Answer, the ability to more properly glorify Him. Are you seeing the God-centered end of His love for us? How about John 17? This is Jesus praying for you. High priestly prayer. We want to ask the question, what is eternal life? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus prays in John 17, verse 1. We know this is his prayer for us, because in verse 20 he's saying he's praying for those to come. So this is Jesus' prayer for you. What is Jesus going to pray for you? Verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life. Ah, got a definition coming. This is eternal life. That they Know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me. Jesus' prayer to the Father for you is that God would glorify him. That can't be love unless it is love. Look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory. That you have given me because you love me. 
before the foundations of the world. Say it again. Eternal life in heaven will not be a hall of mirrors where you like what you see. It will be the one place where in self-forgetfulness you are freed finally to do what you were made for, namely be lost in the worship and praise and cheering and roaring and adulation and exaltation of the one being in all the universe to whom actually deserves it. I'm going to skip Psalm 79, 106, and Romans 5. Oh, read Romans 5 today. Man, oh man. I'm going to skip Romans 15. Huh? I could go for another hour if we want. Adam's shaking his head. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5. We'll land the plane here. Let's ask the question, is God for me? Or is it God for himself? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. So, now we got love and Christ. For the love of Christ, Jesus is loving. He's the fountainhead of love. He is love. He's the definition and the source of love. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore All have died, okay? So this is the gospel. This is the end to which the gospel leans towards. If last week was a biblical study on the glory of God, this week could be considered a biblical study of the end to which God brought about the work of the gospel. What is the good news? For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that Jesus died for all, And therefore all have died. Verse 15, and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. (laughs) Ha ha, it's all right there, you see it? God's for himself, and because he's for himself, he can now be for you, and in being for you, he dies for you, and frees and enables you to be freed from yourself to worship and serve him. God, in being for himself, is how he is for us. That they may no longer live for themselves, but for him. That's the end to which the gospel is given. That you may be freed from living for yourself, which is idolatry, and be enabled to live for him, which is worship. Which means there is a God-centered motive and end to which the gospel was given. One last text, and then we'll be done. 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3, and you don't need to turn there. It's one verse. I'll read it for you. When we ask ourselves, what is the gospel? We think, okay, the gospel is a, it's a plan. Before the foundations of the world began, God had a plan. The gospel is an event, it, something that happened in real time, space, and history. Jesus came down, took on flesh, lived in time, space, history, died on a cross, went into the grave, conquered sin, Satan, death, hell, and absorbed the wrath of God, and then rose again on the third day, was witnessed by hundreds of people, and ascended to the Father. Those are historical events and facts. So the gospel is a plan. The gospel is an event. Then the gospel is an offer. The work that Christ achieved in the event of dying, a substitutionary death in your place, is now given as an offer to anyone who would believe. And we end there, and that's a problem. Come to Jesus and your sins will be forgiven. To which I say, who cares? Who cares if you have a better marriage? Who cares if you have your sins forgiven? Who cares if your guilty conscience is finally cleansed and you're free to not live a guilty life anymore? Who gives a rip? None of those are the end to which God sent Christ. Here's the end to which God sent Christ, 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. That 
he may bring you to God. That's the end to which the gospel takes us. There's a very God-centered, God-glorifying, God-exalting end to his love. Namely, that you may be freed and forgiven of your sins so that you may worship him. That's the God-centered end to which the gospel leads those who are saved. So I'm not saying that God's love free, that God does not love you. What I'm saying is that God's love for you does not terminate on you. You are not the end of God's love. God's love sweeps through you, awakens you, makes you alive, and enables you to get a front row seat, 50-yard line, on the most epic victory human history will ever know and then the party will, will begin and it will never end. And God's love for you is going, hey, I got a ticket for you that I paid for with my life to come watch me clean house if you want to come. The God-centered love of God, the God-centered Motive to exalt himself is how he loves us. Final analogy will be done. When Ella May was diagnosed with spina bifida, we were wrestling with what does it look like for us to love her. And I was using a word in my journal often. It was the word tragedy. God, why this tragedy? Has be, have you allowed to befall us? Why are we facing this tragedy? And this word was filling up my journal and one day I felt like, I don't feel like the Lord speaks to me very often. I, I've never heard an audible voice. But, but you, you read your Bible enough and you get strong impressions and thoughts that you realize I wouldn't have on my own. I feel like the Lord told me, because Sharon and I are wrestling with what does it look like for us to love her because she won't be able to run track like Sharon did. She won't be a 14 sport, all universe athlete like her mom was. She won't be able to hike in the hills like we were planning on doing. She won't be able to do all these things. This is a tragedy. How are we going to love her now? And I felt like the Lord very gently and plainly said to me, Josh, tragedy is not your daughter being born with legs that don't work. Tragedy is your daughter being born with legs that work and walking away from me worshiping something else. Tragedy, Josh, is your daughter growing up with legs that work and you cultivate in her a desire to use those legs in sports in a way that magnifies her like you were kind of planning on doing. And for me, in that moment, the end to which my wife and I parented changed. Loving our daughter and subsequent three children would not look like us making much of them. Loving our children would look like us doing whatever it takes to help them see Jesus, the only one who could really, really, really satisfy their heart and make them happy. And I want my kids to be happy. So loving my kids doesn't look like me making much of them and making them think the world revolves around them. Loving my children looks like me helping them see the world revolves around Jesus and he's amazing and get lose your life spreading that news if I don't foster and pray for and fight for the Copernicus like revolution the sun and the earth to happen in the life of my kids I'm not loving them I'm not loving them so God's self exaltation of himself then the work of Jesus Christ to glorify himself then is the most loving thing he could do. Or another way to say it is, God glorifying himself and us being made happy are one in the same thing. Now you might be asking, what are the implications of that truth? That's a good question. 
there are many and there are and they are massive massive implications for what it means to understand that God glorifying himself and us being made happy are one and the same thing. You might ask, what are those implications? Maybe come back next week and we'll unpack them.